Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. I am your host, Al Richards, and we are here with a very special guest that I met at First Fridays through the West Jordan and South Jordan Chamber of Commerce. Danielle, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, greatly appreciate it. I was actually a facilitator at a table, and you happened to come over the table and did your little 60-second spill, and <clears throat> I was telling Tanya that... Uh, yeah, we wanted to talk afterwards, and I'm like, I really think this would be a great podcast because mm-hmm. I love what you do, and for you guys, if you don't know what she does, she does music therapy, mm-hmm. and I really like that because there are, they're starting to find out, of course, I think they've known it for years, that there's certain levels of tunes and different things like that that really kind of help ground us and help us in a lot of different ways, so... I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the show and what you have to share with us. So thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. And we are joined with a brand new guest co-host, the lovely Tanya. Hi. Tanya, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited. You know, I'm a supporter. I'm a fan of the show. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, you are. As a matter of fact, uh, every once in a while, you'll see Tanya at the gym at the Planet Fitness in Sandy. She'll be sporting the AR shirt, the other side of addiction. So Tanya, thank you so much for supporting us and yeah just uh it's people like yourself that is is helping us grow you know so we we really do appreciate you thank you i'm a fan of the work you do i love the work you do for other people and the community so i'm i believe in you i'm happy to do it yeah (laughs) thank you so much oh my goodness so man i i just love thursdays because we had a guest on the show i don't know if you remember rachel from novus she was at First Fridays, and we had her on our show earlier, and she shared some awesome information. So I'm really looking forward in, in uh, our discussion today. So I've got a little note here that says that um, you are the owner of the Salt Lake Creative Therapy, mm-hmm. right? And you've been doing this for about eight years. Yes, my practice here is new, but I was okay. in practice in Eugene, Oregon for quite a while. I've been up at the hospital up in... Um, Preston, Idaho, doing music therapy there in case management. So now it's moving back into private practice, and I love the city so much. It feels like coming home. So, well, good for yes. you. Yeah, it is a beautiful place, mm-hmm. especially if you love the outdoors. There's so much to mm-hmm. to do here. Um, I got to still get me a pair of snowshoes so I can still go hike. Because oh. I've done that hiking in the snow, and I usually come back with my legs all bloody because <laughs> I'm sinking down in the snow yeah. and it's scraping my legs. Um, what got you into music therapy? What intrigued you? Uh, that's such a, it's such a long story, but, um, I'll oh, try we and got some it, time. But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I was a musician my whole life and then I started studying psychology. Um, it just wasn't a good fit. And then I had some experiences. A, a friend of mine had come back from uh, a tour in Iraq and he was, heavily addicted to pain medications things like that that he was just really struggling anyways seeing him go through that um and just how much pain that was and and then he'd have these like little moments where we were listening to music and he'd feel better um and so i was like well that's cool but then how do i do that with psychology right and and then it was my mother of all people who sat me down at the dinner table and was like well you probably won't finish a psychology degree if you're not super in love with it, but what about music therapy? It's like, that's a thing, which is probably everyone's response, right? You hear music therapy and they say, that's a thing? Yes. (laughs) That is a thing. It's real. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, it has to be real because you're certified. I am, yeah, through the state and the national board. So. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it was just sitting around a dinner table with your mom that kind of... You started really thinking about it. Existential crisis, you know, that's the platform that you jump off into the next stage of your life. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and music, I think music is really, it's a huge part of everyone's life, right? I mean, I know it is for me. I can hear a song that I haven't heard for a while. I mean, I have Sirius XM and I've been listening to the 70s, mm-hmm. you know, on Channel 7. And there's songs that I remember that I loved back when I was like eight, nine years old. And it's like, I can almost remember what I was doing 
at that exact time. And there's even been times I've remembered smells. I can smell mm -hmm. certain things, which is, which is kind of crazy, but our brain works in fascinating ways that just, yeah. And they're finding so many different mediums. It's not just music that's perceived that way. It's music is across the brain in all the different regions and you know both sides so it's really engaging your brain and in many ways but they're also finding art does the same many different things can can stimulate the brain in that way but music does seem to have a really strong connection to memories yeah right as well as senses well, music has been used for thousands of years, right? Mm -hmm. Since before uh, written language. Um, oh, before then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they found, you know, early flutes that had mathematical computations to um, basically have, have the holes in the right place, right? And so, wow. so music and language go, are very, very closely related. They share neural pathways. Um, and also when... Uh, your Wernicke's and your Broca's areas, your language centers, when they're damaged, say in a stroke, you can actually relearn the ability to speak on the other other side of your brain uh, now, through music. You're now actually speaking my language because I am a speech language pathologist. Yeah, and I there you really go. And I was really interested when he told me about music therapy because we do share some of the areas that we work on and even some of the same population. Yep, yep, melodic intonation therapy. That was a speech therapy technique that music mm -hmm. therapists also use. But typically we try and work together because you are the specialists in speech, um, but we're the specialists in music. And so when we work together as a team, we can bring better services to clients. Wow. Well, there can be a connection then here today. Maybe there's something you guys can do to connect and yeah, who knows? Yeah. That, that's what's so cool. I mean, it's like networking on a podcast, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I was, um, we were talking at some of our short ch chats at the gym that... Um, a lot of people that do go in the path of addiction are sometimes neurodivergent, right? And like mm -hmm. how we can intervene or provide some services there in that area and what mm -hmm. we could do about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, do you want to tell us about neuro neurodivergence that we all know? Yeah. That so is? neurodivergence. That's a big word. That's like over my <laughs> I know, head, I ladies. Say it the first time. <laughs> right. Right. Well, if you think about, you know, back to math, math class, right? Okay. And, I promise we won't be doing any computations, right? It's it's gonna be Good, just kind I of an image. Because I sloughed a lot of math I know. classes. The worst, the worst. <laughs> like same class five years in a row, could not get it. But but if you look at graphs, right? And you know, have you seen a bell curve yeah. on a graph? So imagine your entire population of let's say Utah, right? And everyone's on this graph, and someone in some lab has, has assessed their cognitive abilities and placed them somewhere on this graph, right? Of like, are they within this portion of the bell curve or on the, are they out on the outside where the bell tapers? And neurodivergence is where the bell ta tapers. Divergence is moving away from uh, what someone has deemed typical or normal. Um, those are interesting words when you dig into this work. Um, but that's kind of the idea of when we are talking about neurodivergence. That's why so many people are included in this, right? It's not just autism. Yeah. It's also ADHD. It's mental health disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders. Even, I mean, so, some people argue against this, but stroke, traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury, those all fit within um, that neurodivergence because you are no longer the same person that you were and your cognition has changed, right? So you are now diverting away from the typical or norm. So. Wow. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's, there's some of the stuff that the world is coming up with now. And we were talking about that at the earlier show that it's so cool to start seeing, and I believe that there is this curve that's starting to happen where people are starting to realize Man, we have pushed so many things away from us that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years that worked for people. And then, of course, you know, we come in and science is like, well, let us figure this out. Well, you know what? We can change this and we can change that and we can change this. And it's good that we have science because we need it. It's, it's done some incredible things for us. But also, I think it's actually pushed us away from things that we really need yes. as humans. And it's really cool to start seeing the slow 
curve actually starting to come back. You're starting to see people get more into the organic foods and natural way of, of healing themselves, mm -hmm. you know, with the oils and certain herbs and different things. I think people are getting tired of, you know, the going to the doctors and getting a prescription, mm -hmm. you know, and yes, there are prescriptions that are needed because there are people that really do need some and, and they help a lot of people. So I'm not knocking all of it, mm -hmm. but I really do believe that, uh, you know, like we just had Robert Scott Bell on the show and he's, he does the Robert Scott Bell show. He's been doing it for like 24 years. Guy has educated himself in and out when it comes to health. And he's actually cured himself of some health issues by learning natural ways. And none of his family's ever been sick. His, his kids don't even get sick. Mm -hmm. And it's because he's gone back to the old way of doing things, you know. I mean, when Native Americans roamed this land here in, in Utah, I mean, they didn't pick up a cell phone and call their local CVS and say, oh, I got a stomachache, you, you know, I, got, I need a prescription or go to a doctor. They went and picked sage or different herbs and, or roots, right, and to help cure them. And those cures are still out there. Mm -hmm. And music... They said it on Footloose, right? Kevin Bacon said it on Footloose. Right. Music's been celebrated for how many of years? They've used it for all kinds of different things. And um, I got into the brainwave entrainment music years ago. Mm -hmm. um, just went to this seminar, and I met this beautiful young lady, and, and her and her husband, they actually record. She gave me one of her CDs. Mm -hmm. And um, it is so cool just to go home and listen to that, put the headphones on, and, and just listen to these different tones and I'm sure there's tones in there that I'm not even quite hearing but my brain is picking up mm -hmm. and uh, when I first started getting into meditation meditating I was having a hard time shutting the brain off and I understand you're not supposed to shut the brain off you know you're still supposed to kind of let things flow but I can put some headphones on and listen to a little 10 minute brainwave entrainment thing and it really kind of puts me in that zen moment i guess where i can like really chill there's been a few times when i've just laid on the couch put the headphones on and by the time that 10 minutes is done i've got tears rolling down my face and i don't even know why it's hit something mm -hmm. inside me so that's why i find music therapy so intriguing Mm. And you have an interesting point and in like that word entrainment, you know, have they explained that as you're as you're getting into that, what entrainment is, you know, especially in the context of music. Yeah. You know, so entrainment, if you look at like it's a physics principle, right? So two oscillating forces that come into synchrony. If you can imagine the grandfather clock um, situation where he comes down and and he has a room full of clocks and somehow overnight they've all synchronized and now they're at the same pace and they're clicking at the same time right well the same thing happens with your car blinker right you're in a line of traffic and all of the lights start going at the same pace the same thing happens in music right entrainment this word and how does that apply how does that somehow affect you and your physical response to the music it's it's an oscillating force right you and the music and those two forces come into synchrony right that's why um, parkinson's work right a lot of what we're doing there is gate control is we are working on them redeveloping their ability to motor plan for that activity of walking through pacing with the rhythm right same thing with um, social connections too though Right? It's not just that um, it's you and the music, it's you and someone else and the music and you're oscillating together and it's the coming together. And, yeah. and especially in addiction recovery and the people that love you, it's that coming together through music, through shared interest that then you can facilitate that entrainment and that healing that happens within that connection. Wow. You've used some big words that literally are over my head, and I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> However, though, it's, yeah, I just find this so interesting. I mean, I'm sure wanted, you've got some. Well, I wanted to ask because I know what a melodic intonation therapy looks like. I remember yeah. working with somebody that had a stroke that's trying to recover some speech or um, be able to speak again. Mm hmm I know what that looks like, but mm -hmm. I don't know what music therapy looks like for in the terms of recovery, in the terms of an adult client, or how is it different from 
um, working with children and what does so a session oh. look like? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's such a big question. Uh, let's see. Adult versus child, right? Um, actually, I treat my child clients just like I would adults. We're, we're friends. We're coming together and making music. And um, I have a little different approach to therapy, more egalitarian and equal. So so my client and I are together on a journey, right? And I may be guiding and they may be traveling with me. Um, but as far as power, you know, that there's not much difference. You know, I'm there. I will keep a child safe while I'm working with them. So sure, I may need to step into a, a higher power role for that situation. Um, but within the context of therapy, we are equals and, and going through this discovery together. And so... Um, mm. Oh, there's so much you can do with music. It's so hard to kind well, of narrow that down. I imagine, so if I hear music therapy, do I need to know how to play an instrument? Do I need mm-hmm. to know any, I don't know anything about music, right? Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of, I work at a school where a lot of our kids are impacted with special needs. So they have music therapy and I know that their knowledge of music might be, might not be there or mm-hmm. that they might not, that might not be an interest of them. So um, what does a music therapy session look like? Ah, and it totally depends on who I'm working with, right? It will change because um, music can't be this like super prescriptive experience. You have to really get to know the person in order to provide quality services. Um, so generally, we have a wide variety of ways that we work. Um, typically, most of what I do is live music with the client. They don't need any musical experience. There is something accessible for everyone. Okay, I've never worked with someone that I was like, no, you can't have an instrument. No, <laughs> like, that would be terrible. <laughs> you know. You'd probably say that to me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> We'd figure it out. Okay, We'd figure it right. out. Um, and there's, there's always a way to connect, right? Um, even clients that don't necessarily have use of their hands. There's definitely ways to still connect musically. Um, But it's typically live. Um, We can use recorded music. It's just not my my personal um, favorite. Just I feel like there's more connection with live experiences together um, and that authenticity, you know, that you're exploring together. Um, And then we use improvisation. We may play certain songs together for specific reasons. It's very intentional. Yeah. Um, or we may improvise. We may look at lyrics. We may discuss them. Um, we may come up with goofy things with music. There's the silliest game that I play with clients, but it gets them giggling and it gets that therapeutic relationship going. But we throw balls at the drums um, and it sounds silly. It's very silly. But, you know, if it gets them engaged and gets them thinking that, hey, I, I can do music. This yeah. is within my reach. If, if throwing a ball at a drum is good enough for this person, all right, I'm good. You know, I can do this. So it's so wide, like what we can do, anything you can do with music, that's what we do. We have music therapists that are recording heartbeats and recording music with that heartbeat, with the patient. And, wow. and that's their legacy work that they get to pass on to the family, you know, or hold on to or whatever they need to do with that. You know, it's it's there for them. And and so there's just endless creativity. We have, oh, my goodness, we have music therapists that are connecting recorded music to pacifiers, right, for babies that activate when they have any amount of sucking motion. This is shown to get infants out of the neonatal intensive care unit up to two weeks before standard treatment. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do we think that that's based on feeling connection or do you, you know? You can the... definitely, but there's, so that approach is more behavioral, right? There's a stimulus and a response, right? And they learn that, um, that by doing something, trying to move their mouth, then they get a reward which is the music. Oh, so it encourages their feeding and yes. growing. Mm. Oh, that's Holy awesome. cow. That's so interesting. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that every patient is different, right? You, what may work for me probably won't work for Tanya, right? Mm. So you have that, the difference. And I'm sure it's that way with every client. You're not using the same type of project or not projects but the same type of therapy for this for 
each individual. It, it just varies on who it is, what they're needing, and, and you guys base that off of your knowledge of, of them, what they're sharing with you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And sometimes you think that you understand the client and you come prepared with something and, and then you show up to a session and it's like, this is not right. <laughs> scratch. <laughs> yeah, scratch. How about improvisation today? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it just, it just really depends. And that's why, you know, getting into things with adults who are recovering uh, from addiction, that, that it just opens so many possibilities. You don't know what was going on with them. There's not a standard um, model of care necessarily that will work for every single adult who's recovering from addiction. And that's probably really frustrating for insurance companies and for physicians that want to refer services. But it also is the best thing that we could be doing for our clients because a standard gold standard intervention for something as complicated as addiction, it just isn't feasible. And it it wouldn't be appropriate, right? We aren't the exact same person from one person to the other. Addiction has a whole history behind it. And it's so individual, the experience that we have within that context, that that you have to have really individualized experiences. Yeah. You know, we've said on the show many times that our guests come in and, and it's almost like their stories are the same, but they're not. Mm-hmm. And and really it is because there when we first started doing this podcast, I'm thinking my gosh, how long are we going to captivate an audience when they're hearing almost kind of like the same stories coming in? You know, I battled addiction or I was in gangs or, you know, I've been raped multiple times and I fell into addiction. It just, however, throughout as, as, the, as the podcast goes and the interview goes, you still find yourself in a different place. And at least for me and our guest co-hosts feel the same way that they find themselves totally in a different place even if they've guest co-host before on a show mm-hmm. it's like yeah when they first started the show reminded me of so and so when I was a guest here but then by the time they finished I was like off in a whole different area yep. and I think that's what is well it's cool to be a part of this and to hear everyone's journey you know and, and a lot of them their journeys to get out of the addiction and get into recovery some have been the same. Some have been way, way different. I think we've only had maybe one or two that didn't even go to any recovery centers. Mm. They just said, that's it. I'm done. Mm. And they just stopped. Mm. You know, and so I think um, it's just whatever is ready for that person, right, right. at that time. Yeah. yeah. Is music therapy something that somebody can go do while they're... Um, they're- active in their addiction or is there something is it something that you do as rehabilitation after a certain treatment or at what point good question tanya yeah any point in the treatment process it's i think what's really the defining factor is if someone is in a place to be doing therapy and if you're in a spot you know emotionally and developmentally where you can do the therapy you can dig in and do the work and it is work yeah. Um, then, then it's gonna. We'll find a way to work through that. But there is, there should never be judgment. You know, that just further stigmatizes drug yes. use, and and we just that's not helpful. Um, I would say though, like if you're looking, at least as far as what I've seen in my own journey through being on the other side with with partners I've had, or. Um, working in the work that I do and closely with various recovery centers that the common thing that I find in in whether or not someone is ready to make real change is essentially it's a it's a existential crisis is what you need and there's a psychologist uh, Marsha who talks a lot about personality and the development there and and eventually so we have this personality that we are you know when we're kids and then you may have trauma and things that as you're growing and developing, you've got some holes that you're going to have to go back and revisit yeah. and fill in the holes. Um, but to make the real change, the big things, you have to have that introspection. That's why punitive measures for addiction recovery is not effective. right? We know that forcing someone into treatment. Oh, yeah. You may trigger an existential crisis, but if they don't have that crisis, it's not going to work. 
Yeah. And, and you're, you're a hundred percent right. And, you know, and a lot of times when you said those holes that you're help fill in, a lot of times those holes are filled with, from addiction. That's what they pick up in to, to fill those holes. And, you know, many, many times we've had guests say it's not the addiction, you know, that's just the band aid. That's just what we've used to help numb whatever we're hurting, you know, what's hurting us inside. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, the first time my wife went to a rehab, she only went because I was pushing the hell out of her. You know, it's like, you freaking get some help because I'm tired of this shit. Second time, third time, mm-hmm. fourth time. It was me just pushing her, mm-hmm. you know, and she finally clicked and got on. Well, yeah, I'll just do this so I can get him off my ass. Basically is what it, is what it was. And, and it took me a long time to realize. It took me seven years. <clears throat> I'm a slow learner. Apparently seven years is a long time. To, to realize there was not a damn thing I could do, you know. And that's hard as a caregiver and partner and friend or yeah. co-worker that it, did you ever have that feeling of loss of control, you know. And, and that's really common for a lot of caregivers that you want to grasp at straws to, to keep it all together for them. But the hardest thing I think in, in the work that I've done and, and especially personal experiences is letting go of the control and allowing for them to have the meltdown that they need to have yeah. in order to have that real change. You know, I, I wish I would have known about you guys even during the depths of my wife's addiction because I needed a lot of help. You know, I, I tried the al on stuff and it just wasn't a fit for me. You know, after about the third meeting, I remember my wife went to an AA meeting downstairs. I went to an Al-Anon meeting upstairs. I walked out. She comes out and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I will never show my freaking face here again. I'm, I'm done. Mm-hmm. I had nowhere else to go. And I wished I could have known about music therapy, sound therapy, because I think it probably would have helped, helped me in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, the gym helped me because I got to go to the gym and, that was kind of my release of stress and kind of exhaling, but it would only last a few hours and then it was right back because I had to go back home and go right back into the thickest shit again. And, you know, so um, I believe this would would have helped, helped mm-hmm. me quite a bit, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe even helped her, I don't know. But mm-hmm. yeah, you can't force anyone. You can't force anyone to, to change. You know, and it, it goes back to that choice again. You know, it's um, what choice. It, it's like our, our friend Dave DeRoche from the other side Academy says, you know, choose your heart. And it's such a true statement. He's not the one that actually said it first, you know, because it's been said before. But, I mean, basically he's right. Choose your heart. Which one do you want to go? You know, do you want to continue to go down this same road you've been traveling where constant crap is happening to you all the time in and out of jail or you're getting kicked out and you're living on the streets or do you want to do something different with your life? And um, so, yeah, and it's, it's hard for us on the other side. It yeah. really is. And, um, you know, I've, I've got uh, a couple friends who, um, gosh, I just have a, a lady friend who just lost her son to an overdose, you know, and I just can't imagine as a parent, mine's my spouse. That's a little easier. I, I can leave my spouse anytime I choose to leave my spouse, but man, it's got to be hard to want to leave your kids. It's just how can you do that, especially as a mom? Because that attachment's there. I mean, you carried that child in you for nine months, and that attachment, that, that mother bond is so close, it's so hard to just say, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. You know, and right. you have to set your boundaries, and you have to hold to them, which was a mistake I, I made. I didn't, I didn't stick to my boundaries. I'd make boundaries, and then I'd just pop the balloon again. And <laughs> What boundaries, you know? Because... And as a husband, um, as a man of the house, I'm here to protect my wife. You know, that's what I'm supposed to do. And man, it ate me up that I could not protect my wife. There was nothing I could do to help her. Mm. Nothing. And that was so hard for me to take, Mm. you know, because I'm supposed to be there to protect her. Right? Well, and that's a good question. Are you there to protect? It's, It's a good question that I think we all wind up asking I, I really do think that this is such a common experience for us that are in this situation mm-hmm. um and and i want to reflect back to power right where is the power in that question right and when you are in power in control 
does that allow the person to have the existential crisis that they need to recover? And, yeah, and I it's don't, true. It's, it's a question I'm kicking around in my head all the time. And especially as a parent, I have this question all the time is where is the power right now? And it sounds so silly, but I even applied it to the food that my kids are eating. It's so funny, right? You have this parenting struggle all the time of eat your veggies. Like, okay, how old are you? That's how many bites you get, right? Yeah. We all hear these things and these strategies. And I got so frustrated with the power struggle that I had them do the grocery shopping. Huge gamble, right? I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm going to walk home with like marshmallows. bags of marshmallows and cookies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's I want to go I shopping. Expected. But we talked about the different kinds of things that are in the store in the different areas and looking around and, and thinking about how food makes you feel and, and just posing questions. And they filled the grocery cart with like 10 different veggies and fruits and they had breads and bagels and milk and cheese. And like, I didn't do a single thing. Wow. I let them grocery shop. And it was a really powerful experience for me as a parent and, and informed my work as a therapist as well that um, where is the power? And, and how is that affecting that relationship? How much? Yeah. And I'd have to say, like, I was just shocked that, like, they ate everything. They ate bell peppers. Little five-year-old couldn't stop eating it right because i let her explore so you you basically put the power back in in their lap right well and and not just that i didn't abandon them it's not that they had all of this power and they could do absolutely you know whatever they wanted it's right they had a guide with them that was intentional about posing questions and allowing them space to think and that made the difference for them and i i think that's huge you know um we, during the summer, we go to a lot of our grandkids' soccer games. I mean, every weekend we're at the soccer field, usually all day, because all three of our grandkids play soccer. <clears throat> and I remember after one of our granddaughter soccer game, we're walking back to the vehicle, and my wife and I and my daughter and the grandkids and our grandson started throwing a little fit. I don't know why. It just came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I really tipped my hot, hat off to my daughter because she's like, what's wrong? And he's just throwing a fit. And she's like, look, you have a voice. Use it. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was so cool because if I was that age walking with my dad, I would have got a boot up my rear, you know, basically stop acting like a damn baby, you know, or he would have grabbed me and shook me or whatever. My daughter was actually saying, look, if there's something bothering you, say it. So we know what's going on. How do we know what you're upset with if we, if you don't tell us? And I thought that was so powerful. One of my favorite goals to work on with my preschoolers is Mm self-advocacy. I want, I write them goals so that they can advocate for their needs, so that they can advocate for themselves, so they can say stop when something's happening and they don't want it to happen. And I think it's so important to give them to trust that they are intuitive and that people do have willpower to, to choose and that they will choose. And I wonder so much about how this applies to this population of of people that are recovering from addiction that do they have the right to say no? Yeah. Do they have the right to say stop? Can someone that I love who is addicted to a drug, will I respect their no and their stop? Will I back off? That's a good question. Yeah. And then sometimes we have the answer and sometimes we don't. And if we don't, it's okay, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, At it least really we're, is. We're posing the question, and yeah. that's important to start in that space. Yeah. When yeah. you were telling a story about your kids, it reminded me that um, because our fields are kind of connected, right? And we also do um, feeding therapy as a speech pathologist. And one of the rules is that you do your part, right? You offer, you offer the foods, you offer the options, and then it is their their job is to choose. And that kind of applies in the same way to adults. Right. Yeah, you're 100% right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And that goes back to informed consent as well, right? Explaining the consequences and the options, right? But allowing for the space for choice. And and it's interesting, like, I say informed consent because, like, that is a really critical part for people who are in that is that some of them 
just don't have the tools that they need or the yeah. education that they need, right? So much of this has to come back to trauma, right? Are they aware of what they're experiencing without the drugs to know why they are covering up with the drugs? And, and I keep going back in my head to this phrase that I, I heard a while ago, kids do as well as they can, right? People can do as well as they can. And if they're not doing well, if they're unwell, they're not able to do better right now. And so we have to go back to informed consent. Do they have the information to even consent to the behavior that they're engaging in right now? Do they have the information to be empowered to make choices? Yeah. You mentioned well you said. do work with um, recovery centers. What does that look like? Do you do sessions in the centers? Do you re- recruit? Do you have information? Yeah, currently I'm just working within my clinic. I have gone in and done therapy groups, and that's been really impactful for people because they learn from each other. Um, And especially as a music therapist, I will bring an experience, right? And then I do step back a little bit. And I say, okay, well, let's talk about what you experienced. And the things that they learn from each other, or they'll conflict each other and realize that they didn't have skills to manage those difficulties in their social relationships and they're like they walk away from the music thinking like oh well that was actually therapeutic like they're surprised you know Mm -hmm. um because you you really can learn things by making music together much more than actually learning notes or songs wow that's interesting well guys let's take uh let's take a quick commercial break and then um yeah we'll come into the second half and wrap some things up so guys, stay with us. We'll be right back. Have you ever been in a car accident? Do you know what to do after being in a car accident? Are the insurance companies going to take care of you? Hi, I'm attorney Rick Heaton with the law office of Bobby Udall. I will help you through the process and answer all of these questions. I give every single client my cell phone so they can talk to me whenever they need. Let me deal with the insurance company so you can focus on getting better from your injuries. Call me at 385-330-0226. Again, my cell phone number, 385-330-0226. Don't call the insurance company first. Call attorney Rick Heaton at 385-330-0226. Hello, my friends. This is Brad Newfeld, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Resilience Talk Network. You can listen to my show, Resilience, every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. On my show, we will be discussing what it takes for you to overcome the day-to-day challenges that all of us face in life, as well as some of the devastating ones that may lead us to feelings of hopelessness and despair. It's my goal to provide you with the tools and skills that you need to overcome anything that is thrown your way. To find out more about my show, visit our website at www.resiliencetalk.com. That's www.resiliencetalk.com. And as always, until we meet again, go for everything that you want in life and make it happen. This is Leticia with Computer Hospital. We are your computer repair experts for both PC and Mac. We are your community resource for all of your computer repair needs. What makes us different is that we want to fix your computer. We also do free diagnostics. We charge a flat rate labor, which means that you won't pay by the hour. All of our computer repair is done in-house with a fast turnaround time and same day service is also available. Feel free to stop by any time without an appointment. We're located in Sandy at 8721 South State Street. Again, that's 8721 South State Street. Or call us at 801-987-3993. Again, that's 801-987-3993. This is Leticia with Computer Hospital, and we look forward to seeing you soon.
Hello there, this is Brad Newfeld with the Resilience Talk Network, and I would like to introduce to you Taffy Town, one of our newest sponsors. Let me introduce you to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek from Taffy Town. We're proud sponsors of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Taffy Town is a family owned and operated business, still operating in the Salt Lake City area for over 100 years. We manufacture some of America's best saltwater taffy. What makes Taffy Town stand out from all of the others? We have a unique recipe, a whip style recipe that incorporates egg whites, evaporated milk, real sea salt. It's a unique product that is flavorful, melts in your mouth. And the best part is we probably have a flavor for anyone's um, liking, a flavor for any reason, for any season. Uh, we have unique flavors like chicken and waffles, maple bacon, frosted cupcake. Uh, new this year was a pineapple ghost pepper flavor. That's awesome. Where can people find out more about Taffy Town and all of its products? You can check all of this stuff out. All of our products are available uh, for sale on taffytown.com. We ship for free from our website, so all of our pricing on there is, is shipping included. Uh, oftentimes we uh, offer special promotions and discounts to our loyal customers, so do be sure to sign up for an account, and we look forward to seeing what we can do to make you smile with our taffy. Where are you located? We are currently located at 9813 South Prosperity Road in West Jordan, Utah, just at the foothills of the Copper Canyon Mine. Derek, Taffy has always been a great gift to give. What are some of the creative ways Taffy Town can help say thank you to others? Yeah, if, if you're looking for gift ideas, whether to say thank you to friends or family, or maybe to your clients after such a difficult or successful year that you've had, you could look no further than to get a gift idea from taffytown.com. We offer prepackaged gift boxes that say that it's saltwater taffy from the city of the Great Salt Lake, and it tells a little bit about the history of our community and making candy for so long. You can also do customized gifts to pick out just the right flavors or colors of candy for that special someone and deliver even a personalized message in that box to them. So please feel free to check out taffytown.com for any gift ideas this season. Thank you so much, Derek. Please visit taffytown.com, that's taffytown.com, to find out more about the products and services that Taffy Town offers. You won't be disappointed. Do you know someone who's gambling with death due to an addiction? Do you know someone whose life is being turned upside down due to a loved one that's battling with addiction? Hi, I'm Al Richards. I am the host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. I started the podcast due to my wife's battle with alcohol. Let's just say I became addicted to her addiction. Our podcast is helping people understand a little more about those who have battled addiction and those who are hurting from their addiction. Through raw vulnerability, we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides matter of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs, and often confusing paths of recovery. We collaborate with real people and their stories as well as licensed professionals to help our audience gain a better understanding of addiction. You can find us on Resilience Talk Network. You can also find us on Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. That's Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look up the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Other Side of Addiction. I'm Al Richards and we're here with our guest Danielle, who does the music therapy, and the lovely Tanya. Guys, thank you so much for being here. So, so grateful for the both of you. Um, the questions, gosh, the the inspiration that has been shared, I mean, really, and we got into some really deep stuff during 
the commercial break. And Tanya, you had a really, really good question for Danielle, and I hope you can remember it because I remember. Okay, good. <laughs> I got good. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were talking. You said you mentioned that you felt like you had to be your wife's protector. Yeah, which made me think about how arts and music are viewed in society and how we believe music to be more of a feminine trait or like a feminine hobby or a feminine interest. So I wanted to know how often you see men, how how that interaction goes, what the dynamic is, Mm -hmm. the role plays in music therapy. So, and I love talking about gender because our idea of what gender is, you know, in our society has only really existed in the last 200 years. Um, Things used to be very different. In fact, music was male dominated. If you look at music history, who do we study? Men. Yeah, true. that's true. Right. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So gender, it's everywhere. It's in everything. And I'm not going to pretend that it's not in a session because it is. Yeah. Um, though I'm very happy with my gender. I love my gender. And, and so I'm very secure in working with a variety of genders, not just male and female, but with all genders. Um, and, and so I wonder sometimes how well people even understand their own gender. Um, understanding that it is a performative act and not something that you're born with is really important in the therapy process if it is becoming an issue Um, Mm. and developing some understanding around what it is because oftentimes when gender issues come up it's because they have no awareness of what their gender is even is right if you look at uh, psychological testing from years and years ago when they were assessing gender to see if you were on the right track right and the these different qualities, right? So if you think uh, strong and bold, right? What gender is that? Male. Male. Right? What gender is gullibility? Female. Uh Uh-huh. Do you read through I like how she's like, female? Yeah, yeah. Is this like a trap? (laughs) Yeah. Is this a trick question? (laughs) Yeah. I love asking that one because people are like, this is a trap. I know it. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And guess what it is? Because that really is what those gender roles are. It's kind of this thing that puts people in a box into a certain amount of performative roles. And it doesn't actually speak to anything about who we are as human beings. Right? Yeah. And, and gender comes into play with uh, mental health diagnoses. Right? We were talking on the break about men are typically uh, diagnosed more antisocial right, than women are. Um, and women are tend to be, you know, oh she's depressed but a man can't be depressed because he's bold yeah he's brave right men don't get that and my father is a great example this is where i've had to really come to terms with gender is that he's that traditional stoic swedish guy right and he has no feelings unless we're talking about my mother's cooking and then he has a lot of feelings, but how's that cooking? <laughs> right. But then when you come into the context of therapy and how that works when someone comes in. And so I think my understanding of, of what gender is, I, it's so often I see men come in and they are playing a role, right? They are fitting into some box that they think that they're supposed to be in. Yeah, this is sorry, yeah. not not to, not even to their fault, right? It's just like sometimes we mm-hmm. need to adapt this role so that we can survive and move forward in our lives. Yes, yeah. we we need almost to fit in those boxes. Right. In certain and situations. It's not that I want someone to be like questioning, like, "Am I a man?" It's, can you be full of joy in your gender? Can you feel love for yourself and your gender as you are? If you're yeah. a man, great. Let's find joy in it, right? But we learn. Gender is learned. And we have two main pathways neurologically for learning. We have, and I won't go into like scientific names, but <laughs> the two main pathways are joy and stress, right? And addiction actually runs through the joy channel. And it's the same as when you learn something really positively, right? You get a reward in your brain. Whereas stress, if you learn the stress way, you just get 
you know, the product is a lack of stress. Like, oh, finally, the stress is gone. Yeah. And so often men are, are pushing into this, leaning into this stress pathway of, gosh, I don't want to be a, and these are the words, right, that, that we hear. It's yeah. not words that I, I do not recommend using these in regular conversation, but they're like, I don't want to be seen as being gay or sissy. Those words, yeah, yeah, ugh, heard all the time, and and raising a male-bodied boy myself, like he goes through questioning all these things that he's hearing, and what is it to be a man? Um, and he's really securely a little boy. He just had to think through through a different channel, through joy, right? And so, if I can work with someone through joy in expressing their gender. And I'm happy. <laughs> you know, and I think it goes back to that, um, how, how the world has, has, how the world shapes us without us even really realizing it in honesty. You know, I mean, my grandpa and his father and my father and so on, you're taught to be a certain way as a male. Mm-hmm. And this is how you're supposed to hold yourself. And this is how you are supposed to be. And it continues generation after generation after generation. And I'm hoping that I have started kind of breaking a little bit of that. Because my wife tells me I'm in touch with my feminine side all the time. What she means by that, I don't really know. No, I do. <laughs> but, you know, um, and I think that's also the reason why we're seeing um, suicide skyrocket in men. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's because we have been taught that we have to hold ourselves a different way. We have to act a different way. We're not allowed to cry in public. We're supposed to be tough. I remember a couple times that, uh, you know, when um, I had my bad anger issue, you know, there for a long time, I was told you need to go to therapy for it. I'm like, oh, hell no. No one's going to know I'm going to freaking therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. No way in hell. Then one day I hurt somebody I cared about. And they're laying on the floor and I'm going, yeah, I got a problem. Mm-hmm. Right. It took that far for me to go before I finally realized it. And, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I went through six months worth of therapy to learn how to control a temper that was way, way out of control mm-hmm. back in my early 20s. And I still use what I was taught to this day. When I start seeing those blinders close in, I know what tools I need to use to open my vision back up and start going, okay, I don't want to go down this path because it's dangerous. That's interesting. You know, yeah. What tools do people come out of, come out of? After music therapy, does that make sense? Yeah, good question. You're not yeah. taking what do we explicitly, get right? Like yeah. this is, you play the guitar when you feel really angry, right? I imagine right. that's not how it works, but <laughs> what kind of tools? Yeah. Sometimes I was working with a teen who uh, just crushed, right, by life and literally sitting in a ball, right? Um, I just kind of like threw the, t- the guitar in an open tuning, right? So there were no wrong notes. You just play it and it sounds good, mm-hmm. right? So minimal stress, right? And you just kind of slide the guitar over. And this client wound up learning how to play guitar, and it was the greatest therapeutic tool for them. So mm. sometimes there is some learning and we definitely discuss things as we're playing the music, right? So we'll go into the music and then we'll process verbally. Or maybe we'll develop some coping strategies of how to use music effectively at home. Because so with, with addiction, right? It's, it's so much, we've talked about stress. And yeah, that's a huge part of it. So stress management is a, a huge goal that we work on. Uh, insight is another one, right? And we do that through creativity, right? So we found in cognitive sciences that when you engage in a creative process, whether you're an engineer or an artist, it doesn't matter, but you will have these little light bulb moments and you have them in music therapy too. You can get all sorts of insights through what you're playing in your music. Why did I choose to play it that way? what is going on with me? Yeah. Yeah. And that introspection. And and another huge part of the work that I do is, you know, we talk so much about triggers, right? But there's also glimmers and the things that inspire us. You know, as you were talking about inspiration to recover, that those glimmers happen within the music and, and you take those with you. 
And those are memories that are very, very concrete and real to you and you take memory with you everywhere. Even into your old, old, old age that we'll still be able to pull out a song that we learned in our 20s. Right? Same thing with music therapy is that we create these things that stick with us. Um, so I guess that's a really long answer to your question, but yeah, it, it is kind of a mixed awesome bag answer, of things, so, yeah. whether it's, it's real tools to have at home or it's um, something that happens in the experience that helps you to heal and that you'll remember. You know, I remember watching a documentary um, of this young child, I think, I think the parents said like at age of two or three and their child was deaf couldn't hear anything and they played a lot of instruments in the in the family and they're like gosh we got a child here and we're playing this instrument and they can't even hear it well the child ended up putting his teeth when as he started getting his teeth started putting the teeth up on the piano mm. and he learned how to play the piano from the vibration mm. of the notes and it goes to show what music really can do. I mean, even a deaf child who, what, Mozart was pretty much deaf too, right? Wasn't Mozart deaf? It's Beethoven. Beethoven, thank but you, really Beethoven. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Beethoven, well, Never. kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'm still picturing him like the same, but yes, thank you for correcting me. Um, yeah, so uh, it just goes to show how much that, how much music can really help with so many different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times do we, if we've gone through a breakup, you know, usually it's a glass of wine or a whiskey and we turn on the sad songs just so we can feel sad, right. you know, or there's times you can go, oh, hell no, this ain't getting me down. And you start jamming with some stuff, either with a glass of wine or some whiskey, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, because it helps build those emotions back up. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And that goes back to entrainment, right? You yeah. are no longer in the place that you were. You know, so maybe perhaps sometimes you do need to meet yourself where you're at and play the sad song because that's where you're at. You yeah. need the music to meet you. And if you stay there, it's not going to help you. So right. you've got to plan. You've got to be ready to find something else to entrain to. And sometimes that is a pump up song. Sometimes you have to be so gradual and drag yourself out of that spot. And it is so hard. But it is. It's a good tool to use. Yeah. And it brings back to like joy, right? So much of addiction is, is filling in those holes with a little bit of joy, right? And if we found the joy a little bit differently through music or through social connection, through playing music together, right? A uh, little jam session. And suddenly you find yourself not needing the thing you thought you needed, Right? There's a researcher, Yoko Brat, and she does all this research on chronic pain. And pain and addiction get researched together a lot because um, there is a lot of self-medicating habits in, in both. Um, but she tells a story all the time of a singing group that she ran and, and everyone just left and left, you know, in such a good mood. And a few minutes later, this woman comes running back into the room to get her walker because she forgot it. <laughs> she just walked away walked in without she was a walker that so she hasn't up. Yeah. not used in so, so long. Many, many years that she's been walking with a walker. And why did she forget about the pain? Because she had experienced joy. Yeah. It's amazing. It is. What about access to music therapy? How mm. do people get referred to you? How do they get to you? Yeah, so in Idaho, we've been able to work with the Medicaid waiver there. Um, there's a program there. Um, Utah, I'm not sure about. So that part I'm still looking into, but I have done private pay um, for now and then contracted with facilities. There's also grants, grant funding that I'm looking into as well. So, so I'd like to improve accessibility because I really do obviously believe in what I do. So yeah, want everyone to have that. You know, shortly into the podcast um what i picked up you from you daniel um such a lovely person inside and out and you could see that the passion that that you have mm -hmm. um i was watching i mean i get a little teary-eyed just thinking about it because i could see the passion in you you know the excitement and to have someone that does what you do and have that much joy in what they're doing is so huge 
for your clients. I mean, because you can feel it, right? I mean, if you're working with somebody, there's times I've gone to a new doctor and within minutes, I'm like, I don't want anything to do with this freaking guy. I'm out because he doesn't give a shit about me, you know? And then I've usually like my dentist and my doctor, my family physician, I've had them for years and it took me a while to find them. But once I found them and I, and I know who they are as an individual and their integrity, that's, that's what means they're there for me. They're not there for this. They're there for me. Mm -hmm. And I see that in you. I mean, I, you know, I felt a little bit of it when we first met at First Fridays, but now sitting here in this podcast and and watching you do and talk about what you do. Yeah, I I feel it. The energy that you, that you put out and the love that you have for what you do. Yeah, is incredible. So, yeah. I sure love what I do. And the people, right? Yeah. Genuinely love the people that I work with. I'm not afraid of that, right? Sometimes you're like, oh, no, you can't say love. That's your client. No. Yeah, Come right. On. Yeah. <laughs> We've right. known this since the Greeks. There's like all sorts of different kinds of love. And I yeah. really do love my clients very, very strongly. Thank well, we, we need more of that here in this world anyway. We need a lot more love. We, we were talking about that y- yesterday in our live show. Mm. <clears throat> you know, love overpowers everything. It, it really does. And there are different levels of love. You know, if I say I love you, Danielle, it's a different I love you than when I tell my wife I love her. Mm-hmm. But it's still the love. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think that's why all of us here in the studio, and I mean, all of us are such big huggers. It's that connection. It's, it's that love. It's like, hey, I care about you. Right. You know, and it, it changes things. It really changes things. And instead of being so freaking rude and ignorant out there all the time, I mean, I was at our UPS box the other day to pick up some packages, and this guy comes in, and, you know, he's he's all muscly and everything. He comes in, and he gets in line behind me, and this other guy comes in and kind of stands right next to me. And, you know, I don't, he, I don't think he realized the line was a little further so I just kind of stepped up a little bit I didn't say anything I'm like he doesn't really know well this guy behind me was like hey effing dog mm-hmm. you know and he's like cobra and all up get the f out of my space mm-hmm. can't you see it I'm like I'm thinking why you gotta be just such a nasty guy he goes oh uh, do you want to say it you know should I say it? you want to say it <laughs> <The> masculinity <laughs> yeah right I mean you know well and it was the ego you know the ego shit and it's like the guy even said look I didn't realize all you had to say was the lines back here. Mm. And he's like, F you, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm like, what an ignorant prick, mm. you know, instead of just going, hey, you know, the lines, the lines over here, he mm-hmm. has to ego up and throw out that testosterone that, you know, look at me, I'm going to cobra up on your ass and don't mm-hmm. mess with me. And, mm-hmm. but when you have the love, I mean, I've gone to stores before where, you know, you're getting helped by a cashier or even by a waitress or a waiter or something like that, you know, and just a simple, it's like, gosh, you got a freaking great smile. Mm. You just see everything change, everything change. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we need more of that out here in this, in this world. We do. And you know, especially in the way we respond to the things that make us so angry, right? Yeah. There was a young child that I've been working with and they um, have experienced a lot of physical abuse. You can see it. It's it's repeated. And they'll even say, like, well, aren't you going to hit me? Like, and I'm like, no, I'm not oh, going to hit you. <laughs> like, Holy cow. Right? And I, this client has smacked me in the face and said, why aren't you going to hate me? You're going to hate me. And I just say, no, I love you. Yeah. Right. And you can see he just kind of melts. And it all kind of washes away. And and that's what trauma needs, not yeah. more aggression, not leveling up on each other, not more hatred. You know, I knew someone who'd get cut off, cut off in traffic and would like literally write down the license plate number. And like, you have no idea what that person was going through. Like yeah. they could be having the worst day in the world. What if you just love them a little bit, even just the tiniest bit, just a little bit of love. Yeah. See how it goes. Well, you don't, yeah, you don't know if um, they just got a phone call and maybe their cu- child was in an accident or maybe their spouse was in an accident or maybe their family member is having a heart. I mean, you have no clue what's going on. And, and there's been a few times when I've gotten, what the hell's wrong with this asshole? You know, and then you go, well, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, reel yourself back in. You don't know what's, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. And you know, it's, so. 
especially in addiction recovery and the person that you love that's going through this. Yeah. Ooh, it's hard to find that place of love. Ooh. <laughs> Amen to that. Sometimes they really make me mad. Yeah. And it's like, why are you still doing this? But then you stop and you think about it. They do not need more shame. Mm -mm. They need some love. And sometimes you do have to set that boundary and say, you don't get to be in my life right now. And I still love you. Yeah. Nope. Not but, but and. And, yeah. Because but cancels the other one out. It does. Yeah. It does. And you can have both. Both can exist at the exact same time that, oh, I am so frustrated with you and I need some space. And I still love you, and it hurts. Yeah. And all of those feelings are totally okay to have. Man, I used to throw at my wife all the time, you love alcohol more than you love me. I threw that at her so, so many times. <laughs> another dagger. Another right. dagger. Ooh, another dagger. Right. You know, and she'd just be like, no, I don't. And it's like, again, I'm a slow learner. It took me seven years to figure it out. It's like, that woman's full of pain already and full of holes and all I'm doing is punching more in her, not even realizing I was doing it. Right. And you don't you have know? to be the one to fill in the holes. Yeah. You yeah. just make a space, right? See yeah. what happens in the space, right? You are not responsible for their recovery. You're not responsible for yeah. their rage, their feelings, nothing. You are responsible for your experience, your feelings within that space. But making a space in which you can coexist. Yeah. Setting some healthy boundaries. Right. Yeah. And, ch and yeah, choose the right one. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes take that deep breath. You know, sometimes I have to walk away and take a deep breath and mm -hmm. it's OK, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, just to kind of to bring yourself back. And again, that goes back to maturity again, you mm -hmm. know, understanding. It's like if I say what I want to say, it's just because I'm saying it because I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And I know if I say it while I'm angry, it's not going to come out the way it's meant. So back off. Take a deep breath. Come back to it when you've calmed down. And, yeah, and it helps everyone, mm. especially yourself. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we get all your information. You have mm -hmm. website, social media stuff. Yeah. We need to make sure we have all that. Sure um, we definitely want you to share it on the show. But we also need that so when the show posts, people have a way of, of contacting you. And um, anything we can do to help just let us know. Um, we've got some great resources out there. You know, we've we've made great relationships with the Other Side Academy, mm -hmm. Corner Canyon Health. They changed right. their name from Corner Canyon um, Recovery Behavioral to Corner Canyon Health. I mean, we've got Wasatch Recovery. We've we've got so many different people that we're working with. We just worked with a gal out of Canada. Um, love what she's done she's been on the show twice and she wants to come back in february so we're going to have her come back in february and she helps a lot of people on the other side of the addiction mm. she's battled addiction 30 something years now in recovery um however she realized that when she's going through recovery there's a lot of help for those going through addiction but there wasn't really a lot of help for those on the other side which she's 100 percent right mm. you know there's not a lot of areas for us to go to to get the help and the right help the right direction yeah. yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like I really learned that um, there's a lot of options out there right, that you will. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have that amazing therapist ability to see people for who they are and the whole person, right? Yeah. Not like the one thing that's the bad thing, but the whole person and what they need. And um, just want to try the point that everybody can give it a try because we don't really know like the. Mm -hmm. The bell curve doesn't work for everybody, and mm -hmm. you do something that's a little bit different, but that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, and I do also want to give you props because I can tell that you're so dedicated, and that oh, I love that you're able to see a person for who they are and meet them where they at, and that's mm -hmm. amazing. I think you two are amazing. By the way, this oh, is so cool well, to get to you. know you better. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I yeah. I just met Tanya like a week ago. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, we go to the same gym and yeah, she's seemed like she was always working out her legs. So I'm like, Hey, do you play soccer? I think that's what yeah. I said to you. She I like, guess. no, you know, but yeah, we've just become friends and it, it's so cool because, um, 
gosh, we've had quite a few people on our show that have come from the gym. I mean, Dr. Mike came from the gym. I was introduced to him by someone else that I know at the gym. And Jeffrey, who was on our show yesterday, he was coming in doing um, some group workout when he, well, he's still with Corner Canyon. I just went up and started talking with him one day. And I've had the privilege of going out and talking to their clients twice now, mm. which has been really, really cool. But he's come from the gym. And, and you were wearing my shirt the other mm-hmm. day and um austin that guy come up and he yeah. come over and talked to me and and he him and his Luckily wife were both in recovery next to me so i was yeah. like oh yeah this is him yeah. <laughs> and then I pushed him right over but yeah. and then i told oh, if you don't show you don't sell you gotta tell people what you're doing yeah. and yeah. that it's there for them so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i love that it's great i've listened to quite a few episodes of this podcast in the last week just to kind of get to know your format a little bit better and yeah. be like, okay, where am I going? I'm not going to get murdered, am I? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all cool here. I mean, yeah, I'm like, if you do, it. I have a playlist for this moment. Like, yeah. I'm a millennial. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, and it's it's funny because um, a lot of times when I ask females if they'd like to come on the show, I always let them know. I'm like, hey, if you want to bring your husband or a boyfriend mm-hmm. or partner or spouse, a friend, I, I don't care. You know, if it makes you feel comfortable, bring them. You know, and there's times when, gosh, we've had four people packed in here, you right. know, just to see. And then when they get in here, they're like, oh, yeah, they, mm-hmm. they get relaxed really, really quick. And yeah. I think even with Tanya, I told her, you know, when she said she'd like to be a guest host, I'm like, if you want to bring your husband, Chris, because I, I was introduced to Chris, uh, her husband. I was like, feel, feel free, you know, whatever makes you feel comfortable, because we don't want you to come here and, yeah, feel mm-hmm. like. And, and I, I usually do my best to have a female guest co-host, especially when we have females come in, because it kind of it helps them to where they don't feel so intimidated. Mm-hmm. Not saying that all of them do feel intimidated, but some might. To be so, fair, I am the nice. scary tattoo lady. Like, you can see a little bit. Tattoo. So maybe you I should be saying, scared of me. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was in the room. Yeah. Yeah. You okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You know, we did and have you a... you know me. I, you know. Yeah, right? I kick your butt. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, well, do you know Angie from the gym? Cute redhead gal. Always wears a cap, ball cap. Oh, yeah. She's yeah, there yeah. sometimes, but sometimes mm-hmm. she goes to another gym. So she walked in today, Matt, and she was flaring up. She, I was over there talking with Olivia, and she comes in, and she's like, that fucking asshole was like this far away on Slick Rose. And that guy walks in, and she just gave him the freaking glare. And I'm like, damn, girl, you go get him. <laughs> you know? Uh, as an asshole driving crazy. I mean, she was all at it, but, uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, it's great. I, I love, I love doing the show. I love the guests that we've had come in. I, I've, I've not once in over a year and a half, we've been doing this show, been disappointed with any of our guest co-hosts or our guests. And it's crazy. Cause there has been a, sometimes when we'll do a show and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, how are we going to get an hour out of this? And then all of a sudden it just, it just seems to click and everything goes and mm-hmm. and bringing different people in as guest co-hosts they bring a whole new spin mm-hmm. on things and it's it's really cool to have somebody else's outlook and perspective on things and mm-hmm. yeah we just appreciate all you guys and um, we want to do everything we can to help promote other people mm-hmm. you know um, we're not just here for us because if we were then we'd be selfish sons of bitches the way I see it <laughs> we're here to help whoever we can you know get out as much information mm-hmm. you know and, and Tanya was she was up front with me one day she you know was listening to some of our shows and and she says well it'd be nice if you had a little bit more information on certain things instead of just the addiction things and and she was a hundred percent right mm-hmm. you I know I was just thinking yeah. that the tart like who would be the target audience right in that sometimes that I love it and I love supporting the show but I have to be almost like emotionally ready to listen right Mm -hmm. because it's heavy information like it's really deep information and I would say some information that is like like I think music therapy is great right because Mm -hmm. we're not just talking about the story and like the we're talking about really great things but not just the sad parts of it but like yeah. what what can we do what's like out there so yeah 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 and it was and it was great information and i appreciate you coming out and saying that you know because mm-hmm. that just helps us become better mm-hmm. you know and and again whatever we can do to help out if there's connections i mean we've helped people meet we've made some connections with some things um you know i think that's 
well, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the Wednesday live show, because it's more more about the information of what we can get out there. You know, we got a gal coming on from Clean Slate, Utah to help people clear their records and mm. different things. We got Dr. Eliason coming on next week, you know, to talk about a new therapy that they're using that's helping in recovery. And um, <clears throat> one of the ones I, I cannot wait for in February is, um, and I tell you what, this, this, young, this young lady, um, I got a little emotional even, I, I met with her her mom and her dad and her and they're from Idaho and my friend Anna interviewed this young lady 13 years old and she was sexually assaulted and what happens to the majority of them they cover it up they're ashamed they feel like it's their fault a lot of times they fall into the addiction this little gal sexually assaulted 11 years old and at 13 she's talking about it and I tell you what I, I told her I says I'm old enough to be your grandpa but I'm like, I look up to you. This mm-hmm. is you, you are just, I get most talking about. She's just an amazing young woman. And I cannot wait to, to interview her in February because she is an inspiration, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I'm hoping that people that hear this, because <clears throat> I, I, I'm pretty sure there are, there are people out there that stuff's happened to them. And I have some lady friends that's happened, that's happened to them, and they still haven't gotten to a point to where they really want to discuss it. And I'm hoping this 13-year-old girl will change that mm. because it is good to talk about it. It is good to get it out, mm-hmm. you know. It so is. we we cannot, we got to stop being ashamed, you know. I, I didn't talk about my wife's addiction for a long time. I didn't share with anybody mm-hmm. because I was ashamed. I was afraid of what people were going to think of her, think of me. You know, so, and I kept it in, and I kept it in so long in 2019, I was on my way home from a first Friday, back when we had 130 people come to this event, and I'm like, I'm going to go home and get my pistol, and I'm going up in the mountains, and I'm done. Mm. I cannot come home to what I'm coming home to, and it's it's pretty selfish. You know, luckily, I got a phone call, and, and um, when I hung up, I saw the picture of my two daughters and three grandkids, and I just broke down and started bawling. And I was crying so hard I couldn't even see the road. I had to pull over, and that's kind of what started changing my curve mm-hmm. on things. And um, yeah, there's other people. There's a, we're not the only ones suffering, right. you know. And that's what we think. We think we're the only ones suffering. We're not. Mm-hmm. You know, a good friend of mine told me when we were having coffee, he's like, "Dude, you got to share your story." And I remember telling him, who the hell wants to hear my story? And he goes, who the hell wouldn't? Because there are other people going through the exact same thing you're going through. Mm -hmm. And that really opened my eyes. I'm like, holy shit, he's right. So why not be vulnerable and come out and talk about it? And don't don't be ashamed. Absolutely. You know, that's why I think the show that I talked to you guys about during break, because I don't want to spoil it right now, but that we're going to have here in the near future on a live show. That's why I think that one's going to be so important. And Mm -hmm. I'm so happy for my friend uh, Chanel who brought that up mm. so and know. I think it's important to recognize too there's I can feel so much passion coming from you and I knew when I met you like you just have that that personality you just you want to help so deeply and I you know just to reflect back like you did the best that you could at the time yeah. and now you're doing even better like look at what you're doing it's amazing right so I just really appreciate the privilege to come oh, and talk you. with you. I think you're taking it a whole other step. Like these stories, yes, they're, yes, they are sad. They, you feel sad, but it's no longer just a sad story. It's a common story. Yeah. Right. These things are common, and that's what's scarier than it being a sad story, is how common it is. Um, and and yes, it, I think we're at a point that socially we know what's going on we know we have statistics even that's scary that we know these issues well enough to have statistics on them and and so I think what's important to like embrace with what you're doing is that you're taking it a whole other step you're providing education to move forward you're providing something that people can do something with and that I think is worth it thank you Thank you. Appreciate both you guys. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Is there one last thing you guys would like to share with our listeners? Just, no? No. Nothing? Just keep doing doing the thing. Just keep trying. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Guys, thank you so much 
for uh, tuning in. Thank you for all your support. And again, please, if you guys hear one of our podcasts, just share and like it and uh, share it with one friend, just one. Don't spam people, just share it with somebody and ask them to like and share it because you never know what that podcast will do for someone. It may help your friend that you sent it to or maybe they know someone who's suffering and, and they could listen to the show. So uh, thank you to all our listeners. Thank you to our many, many sponsors. Um, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for all of you guys. You know, um, the studio's changing quite a bit. If you go back and look at our first show, it was pretty blah in here, but uh, it looks pretty damn cool in here now. And it's thanks to all you guys, all our sponsors. So thank you so much. Thank you to Resilience Talk Network, to Brad and to Mason uh, for all the things that they do and producing the shows and doing all the cutting and editing. All the amazing guests that we've had on from day one to this day. Um, all the great co-hosts that we've had come on the show. So thank you, everyone. Greatly appreciate you. Love every single one of you guys. And remember, addiction is giving up everything for one thing, and recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.